Can everybody hear me okay? Hello, everybody. So uh, I'm a product manager on Cognitive Threat Analytics. That is our advanced threat uh, technology uh, that we apply across the portfolio. I'm going to be talking about a couple uh, example cases from the cloud web security environment. Before we get started, uh, can I maybe just start by uh, uh, figuring out uh, who of you is familiar with the Cloud Web Security offering? I'd like to establish that before we dive into the details. So Cloud Web Security, sounds familiar? Excellent, excellent. So that is the, the web security proxy sitting in the cloud. Now what we're introducing with the, the Cognitive Threat Analytics is additional layer of detection to identify advanced threat. Let me get into the, the content and motivation for that. So when we talk to our advanced threat customers, they're going to agree on a number of things. Number one, the reality that they deal with has changed. So there are threats out there that are going to be able to get into their environment, and they um, suddenly need to um, operate in this different um, uh, reality where they're actually hunting threats that have penetrated the environment. Number two, and it may seem surprising, but majority of our advanced threat customers are going to agree that advanced threats, they mostly get into their environment by uh, infected email. It is as simple as that. A human being, at the end of the day, clicks on an infected email attachment. And then the third element that is also real, real important, and that is backed up by our internal threat research, is that the most common uh, command and control channel for advanced threat is actually going to be web. Why? Well, uh, the, the, the threat knows and works with the assumption that web channel is mostly open. So, so they are going to use that. Um, so all these things give you uh, the motivation of if you want to be uh, dealing with advanced threat in the, um, in the post breach uh, phase, you want to be analyzing the web traffic. And so this is exactly what we're doing. Um, you may have seen the before, during, and after model. I, ex I expect you have seen that in other conversations. We actually use that uh, when we talk about security across all of our portfolio. So, so this is a very simplistic model that allows us to talk about the phases of an attack uh, lifecycle uh, and also the, the protection mechanism. So what is it that you should do before an attack? What do you do during an attack? What do you do after an attack? When we are talking web security, all of the web security industry has been heavily focused on the before and during phases, so these two. What we're introducing as a very new concept is if you want to be serious about security, you need to actively operate in the after phase. And this is where we provide the additional level of analytics from the cognitive threat analysis. Now, on this next slide, you actually see a breakdown um, of how all of the cloud web security premium capability maps into the before, during, and after model um, uh, uh, capability by capability in the three different, uh, different phases. One more thing that I'd like to uh, say uh, specifically to web security, um, the, the before, during, and after model do have a distinct meaning there. So the before phase is before a request is even made um, and leaves the, um, uh, the network environment. Um, so this is a phase where we can apply um, IP reputation check policies that you have defined within uh, your network environment. And then the requests that actually go out and they're going to reach the, uh, the destination web server and a response is coming back. This is when we actually transition effectively into the during phase. And out of the content that's coming back, we're going to be able to um, uh, assess that further. And, and apart from the traditional mechanisms that we do have in the anti-malware uh, domain, outbreak intelligence, so things you would generally be familiar with on, on the cloud web security, we're adding two additional technologies in the advanced threat space. One of them is AMP from the source fire acquisition. That is a technology pivoting on file reputation. So any files that we cross-check in our uh, knowledge base of over a billion samples, we find uh, malicious based on uh, file analysis, file behaviors, and correlation. We block it right there. Anything that is an unknown type of file, so unique for your environment, we're going to pass that into file analysis. And that's where we're already entering the after phase over here. Um, and then what we also have in the after phase is the cognitive threat analytics. So to give you additional level of visibility into threats, we're going to um, apply uh, additional level of analytics that's looking into 
uh, network behaviors of individual users within the context of the entire network, looking for symptoms of this particular user does no longer resemble communication of a human being behind their browser, but it actually resembles communication of an infected device that's establishing command and control. So what we're after uh, in the after phase is the detection of command and control activities. And I'll actually take you through a uh, deep dive um, of the detection technology. I'll zoom in on the cognitive threat analytics part. It is a uh, layered um, detection engine that um, is working with, it's, it's providing anomaly detection. And whenever you look at a, um, an engine like that, uh, that is performing statistical modeling and machine learning, uh, you try to um, optimize against two criteria that are uh, uh, competing against each other. Number one, you want to cover and capture anything that is um, anomalous, potentially malicious out there in those, all those behaviors on the network. And at the same time, on the things that you finally alert on, you want to be very, very precise. And in order to achieve um, uh, um, uh, maximum output on both of these criteria, this is where we apply the layered processing, where we initially focus on anomaly detection. And as we go through the engine, we uh, go and refocus on being very, very precise on the things that we finally alert on. So to go into the details layer by uh, layer, oh, before I do that, let me establish one thing to, uh, that is really um, um, uh, a key to, to define. So our advanced threat portfolio, we have the two technologies there, AMP, working on um, uh, file reputation, inspecting content of files that are actually traversing through the perimeter. So how does that uh, work and orchestrate together with the, the CTA capability? So AMP actually, think of that as providing you additional, uh, additional protection against a direct attack from the web. So someone actually is trying to deliver malicious payload through the web perimeter. We're going to block that right there or analyze that further, inspect that further to alert you at a later point in time with the retrospective capability. Next to that, you have the, the cognitive threat analysis um, uh, engine that is going to analyze behaviors purely by looking at the, the network traffic uh, telemetry. So what we process is the web logs. We're not looking into the, uh, the, pay, uh, the, uh, the payload, the content. We're purely looking into the the network traffic. And um, by doing that, uh, and by focusing on anomality, we actually give you the inherent capability to identify threats that would have already uh, penetrated the environment, uh, perhaps entirely bypassing the, the web as an infection vector. So, so think of an infected um, email, infected USB stick that gets into the network environment, infects uh, a number of devices, uh, and then you're in front of that question so, of containing that threat. So who's infected? And, and CTA will give you that uh, visibility uh, right there. And you'll see that on a number of examples. So AMP, additional protection against a direct attack. CTA, giving you detection of just any threat that is already in sight. And I forgot about the, the animation. So now you get it in a, an animated fashion. So there is actually going to be infections that can get in, that you, uh, you're going to be able to, to discover by analyzing the web traffic. So let me now take you through the different uh, phases of the, the CTA processing engine. So number one, um, to give you an idea of the processing scale of that engine, we start off by processing, and I'm talking about our production environment, we're processing some uh, 10 of billion requests, web requests on daily basis. Out of that, going through the careful uh, selection of first anomalous traffic, malicious artifacts, we end up with thousands or thousands of individual incidents on daily basis. That kind of gives you the amount of processing power you have to have. Um, this is why we actually operate all the analytics in the cloud, because it's a lot of um, a lot of computational ho horsepower that you need to actually crack down the, 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 the big data problem here. Um, and now, going into the, the respective parts. So we first 
in our layer one out of three layers, we first focus on identifying what is anomalous on the network. And we work with uh, a portfolio of techniques from statistical um, uh, modeling, uh, machine learning, um, artificial intelligence. This particular example actually shows uh, an ensemble classification where we do have 40 plus individual detectors where each one of them is an expert on certain type of anomaly in the network. And, and then they're going to take a collective vote. So think of a jury uh, here in the US where you have uh, multiple individuals that are going to vote independently. Um, if one of them is, is say, wrong in, in this sense of the detection, the others will overrule if the, uh, the, uh, the original assumption that they are independent um, holds. So we operate 40 plus detectors that are going to take their votes and they're going to, each one of them is going to give an assessment of the individual request that they're seeing. Is it uh, normal or is that uh, unknown type of behavior or is that anomalous type of behavior? And these individual requests and, and verdicts are then going to aggregate in a, uh, in a um, uh, more uh, complex structure that keeps um, uh, the model of the, the behavior of the entire network over time. So what we're going to do is we're first going to, and I'll show you an example of if you have an individual detector, that one individual detector is going to dissect the, uh, all the web requests that it sees in a fraction of time. It's going to split it into everything that is normal and then everything that's anomalous. And obviously for an individual detector, it may be wrong at times. So it will have some false negatives here and also some po false positives on the other end where it actually misclassifies. But by putting more of the individual detectors together and we have 40 plus that actually collaborate together, and by projecting their assessment over time, where we built a long-term stable model of the entire network, we're going to eliminate, um, eliminate huge amounts of the potential false negatives and false positives that would have appeared. So what you'll see that by aggregating the votes of the ensemble, you're actually making a very clear um, uh, distinction between the normal and anomalous traffic on the network. And then when you have that, the, uh, the collective votes of all the, the detectors are actually going to stabilize over time. This phase is called trust, called trust modeling, where you model the trust of individual um, uh, uh, actors on the network over time. And, and as more requests are coming in, we are going to create um, structures of similar behaviors. So all of a sudden, you will build a notion of which types of requests are actually collectively identified as anomalous. These are the ones for further processing to actually identify as part of incidents to actually trigger security incidents. You're also going to have additional ones that are unknown or legitimate for additional context of the final security findings. Going further, we have now gone through the uh, layer one of our processing going into layer two out of uh, three. When we have identified individual web requests as either normal, um, unknown, or anomalous, we're then going to bucketize them. We're going to classify them into three sections of behaviors. So recognize legitimate behaviors, um, unknown uh, behaviors that go into uh, suspicious classification that are going to work as context of uh, uh, individual malicious findings that we dig out. And then finally, the, the clearly anomalous behaviors that, by the way, are roughly uh, less than a 1% of all the traffic. They are going to get classified into indicators of malicious activities on the network. So uh, data tunneling, um, uh, attempts to establish command and control, etc. So these individual requests are going to be the basis for the incidents. And we take that further. So we started by analyzing individual web requests. We have later uh, aggregated, that, I aggregated the individual web requests into uh, events that will give you a sequence of individual requests that is part of a malicious activity, such as an attempt to establish command and control. 
and then we take these individual events and we'll be aggregating them across uh, the devices on the network. And if these devices are showing enough of um, malicious events, they're going to be identified as a threat, so a device that is infected with, uh, with a threat that is possibly emerging unknown, uh, undetected on the network. And as time goes by, we're going to collect additional events that appear for the individual devices to, um, to create uh, a notion of additional devices that are actually turning into uh, devices that we can convict as uh, carrying an infection. So now what we have done, we have identified individual devices exhibiting uh, malicious behaviors. They do have a threat sitting on the device, uh, showing traffic, uh, network traffic that is largely uh, anomalous, uh, different than what anybody else is doing on the network, different than what is the common behaviors on the network. So you have individual devices that are infected. We're further going to correlate infections across multiple individual um, devices to understand that there is a, uh, in fact, a threat campaign that we're mapping out on the local scale within an individual network and also on a global scale. So we're going to do a lot of correlation here. So number one step is we're going to um, bring together incidents that are uh, behave from behavioral perspective similar. So, so the, the events that have uh, triggered incidents, they are coherent and, and similar to each other. So this is one individual incidents on one particular network are pulled together as part of a campaign. And we go further. Uh, in the next processing step, we make a step outside an individual network and start uh, building a global context of a threat. And finally, uh, we start mapping out a uh, threat infrastructure for, for the infection to actually extrapolate further uh, to map out the, the entire threat infrastructure that we can see. So finally, and I'll show that on a uh, couple examples, when we present findings, we're going to tell you uh, there is a threat uh, with a uh, risk level and a confidence of the detection engine, and that threat has local footprint of, say, one or two users within your environment. But on the global scale, we see additional 10 plus users. So it's going to tell you, yes, this is emerging, and this is possibly targeted. It's not a, it's not a widespread uh, infection. There are only uh, additional very few users on the global scale that are also affected. One example to, sh to show um, uh, the, the detection on the, the individual flows. So imagine a device that is going through the Cloud Web Security Proxy. Um, and these are all the different requests that that device performs. We're going to identify uh, symptoms on the individual requests, identifying finally a full spectrum of command and control activities and then uh, filtering out uh, the ones that are still active, not blocked. So we have, uh, right over here, we have identified an active command and control channel. So what may be happening is updates of that, uh, of that threat, uh, data leaking the organization, in general instructions that are going back and forth. Uh, so in order to summarize, I just went through the, uh, the description of the processing engine that um, has the three distinct layers, just to uh, re-emphasize, in order to provide as high um, um, uh, as possible of a recall on the detection engine, so identifying as many of the malicious, uh, unknown uh, um, activities that are there on the network, and at the same time, uh, provide very, very precise findings this is why we choose to um, uh, run a layered uh, detection engine like this, uh, where we're moving from first the, the notion of anomalous behaviors on uh, individual web request spaces. We further aggregate that into a notion of malicious events uh, that give you sequences of individual requests to finally uh, trigger incidents that then identify threats within the network environment. Now, to give you uh, an idea of how that reporting engine then works and, and what is it that you're going to consume off of the, the detection engine. 
uh, we do identify two categories of threats, confirmed threats and detected threats. So confirmed threats are the ones that do actually have additional global context. So it is an infection that we're tracking not only on uh, one individual network and on one individual user, but we see a wider context of that threat. Uh, this is when we're able to actually bump up the confidence on the detection and tell you we are 100% certain that there is an infection. And we're also going to be able to tell you what the global footprint of that threat is. And we're going to identify, yes, this is an emerging uh, threat um, that you do not have any knowledge about because it's a malicious infrastructure actually uh, changes on daily and hourly basis. But from the, the global behavioral foot, uh, context, we're able to pull in a context of there are additional users affected. And it is, in fact, the very same thing. Uh, and we're going to show that in a format of a threat report that's going to exactly tell you what is the risk level of that detection, uh, what is the confidence, the local global footprint. And difficult to read. I'll have other examples that are actually easier to read. Uh, another uh, goodie is that for the confirmed threats, we're going to provide additional context. So if you actually want to understand more of what is the nature of that threat, we're going to give you samples from our uh, M ThreadGrid uh, uh, malicious artifacts database. And we're going to show you uh, um, additional endpoint behaviors that we're tracking in ThreadGrid so that if you choose to run forensics on the infected device, you get the additional context of what that threat would have done on the endpoint. So by first looking at the network traffic and identifying an infection based on looking at the web logs, uh, we then pivot on additional uh, information to give you a context of what we believe has happened on the endpoint in terms of damage. And finally, we also present um, uh, threats in uh, f form of detected threats. That is the ones that are identified for individual users. Uh, they are delivered with below 100% confidence. Um, and for, I would say, uh, more um, uh, uh, more sophisticated organizations, these are the ones that they are particularly going to be interested in because they are actually the, um, the suspected targeted attacks. So they're going to require additional review by a security analyst, but they actually give you the, uh, the visibility into simply uh, anomalous outlier behavior that is highly indicative of command and control and malicious activity. Uh, that is possibly targeted at an individual because there is no additional global footprint. We do not see that behavior at any other organization globally. And then when we identify behaviors like this, we're going to map it out uh, in form of a uh, report that presents the command and control activity that we've identified on the individual user so that you can, uh, again, uh, contextualize that across your, your network and, and convict the threat from your perspective. And this is the overall processing. So how we move from uh, the notion of anomality to uh, building and stabilizing the model over time, classifying uh, behaviors of users to actually identify individual devices as infected and pull them into a global context of a threat campaign. I'll fast forward a little bit into a couple examples here. So one example where we're modeling um, uh, uh, traffic activity on uh, a particular network, uh, we're alerting on command and control for over a period of 20 days. Uh, the customer is trying to confirm that by endpoint security um, measures, and they are largely unsuccessful. It always takes a week until their uh, endpoint security discovers something and tries to clear that, uh, but then that infection doesn't go away. What they end up dealing with, uh, and what is the, the recommendation from day one is, this is in fact a, uh, a rootkit capable infection that is a multi-component type of threat where if you discover something uh, by traditional endpoint security means, you have only discovered um, a, a piece of that threat on the surface, and, and so you're never gonna be able to, to resolve that threat by applying uh, simple antivirus or anti-malware check. So what they en end up having to do and what customers uh, have to do with most of these infections is actually a re-image. That is the only way 
to get rid of an advanced threat that is um, at, on the first place undetectable by, by the traditional security means. Is the time over? One more minute, okay. So I'll, I'll close on a couple more examples here. So, um, and, and this was a variation of a Zeus Trojan family. What you see is this. Um, uh, the, the threat actors are going to drop variations in there that are going to be different every hour. So that's why, from endpoint security perspective, very difficult to identify. But uh, we're able to identify uh, from the network traffic behaviors um, a coherent activity. And that is what allows us to pull all that activity together to actually convict the endpoint at the, at the end of the day. Um, and this is an example of the command and control uh, activity that we have mapped out for the particular user. So you see a primary, secondary, tertiary command and control channel. What well, the, these threats are going to try and do, they're not going to rely on an individual uh, connection point. They always try to talk multiple channels and um, uh, to, to effectively get through. Another example, oh, and uh, many of these cases we're actually going to see uh, encoded or encrypted communication. Uh, I'll show you in this one case, we're actually able to decode the communication to actually identify the type of information that is passing back and forth in the HTTP headers or the URL request that actually indicate uh, user tracking activity um, vulnerability assessment of that user so that the attacker is trying to um, uh, infect that user further with delivering additional uh, threat components to um, uh, trying to uh, enlarge the footprint of that threat within the, 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 cast, uh, with, within the network environment. Um, I think we have time for uh, uh, two final examples. Uh, a quadbot infection, one that uh, originally appeared 2011 um, to be taken down and re-emerge in 2014. Uh, one of the characteristics is its malicious infrastructure, the threat infrastructure, changes very, very rapidly. So again, that's why uh, traditional endpoint security means are largely uh, ineffective in identifying. But if you look at it from the network behaviors perspective, you're going to uh, map out an entire uh, coherent uh, malicious infrastructure. And that takes me to a final uh, one, uh, a DREDEX variation, similar case, a, a threat infrastructure that is uh, changing on a uh, daily and hourly uh, basis. And analyzing the web logs will help you keep on, stay on top of that threat. That would be the couple fast examples. Thank you very much for your attention.